In 1995, a new plant pathogen was detected in a California woodland north of San Francisco. After that, many oak trees died along the North California coast. The pathogen was identified as a fungus in 2001 and named Phytophthora remorum. In Washington, the first P. remorum positive was found at a King County retailer in 2003. In 2004, we found 25 nurseries that were positive in Washington. So that was sort of a, that was an anomaly that year. After that, we became regulated. The USDA passed a federal order and nurseries shipping out of Washington had to be certified for EAP remorum. So if they had host material, they had to be sampled and certified once a year, and they operated under a compliance agreement to ship. So between the years of 2004 and 2014, there were about 105 participating nurseries that we sampled and certified. During that time, we detected it on average about six times a year. So overall, the percentage of positive nurseries was very low and in 2014 the regulations changed and because there were so many nurseries that were negative over time they decided to focus just on the nurseries that had been positive. All the other nurseries were deregulated. So as of today we are only working with one nursery that we certify. Uh, in 2015, Washington as a state was completely deregulated for P. remorum. P. remorum has the potential to become a serious and economically significant problem, but it does not exist in Washington's native environment and landscape. However, we should all be on the lookout for suspicious symptoms. P. remorum can infect many species of plants, including rhododendrons, camellias, viburnum, calmia, and pieris all considered highly susceptible, along with native plants such as salal and evergreen huckleberry. Currently, the only way to confirm is with laboratory tests. This is the story of a P. remorum detection at Bloedel Reserve and how they worked successfully with regulators and researchers to mitigate the disease and prevent further spread. The Bloedel Reserve is a 150-acre public garden and forest preserve uh, located at the northern end of Bainbridge Island. We have about 20 distinct uh, landscape experiences, including uh, gardens and forest landscapes. Um, and really, it was uh, developed by Prentice and Virginia Bloedel over the period of the 1950s to the 1980s, they worked with a number of noted landscape designers and architects to explore different types of landscapes that really made you feel uh, different ways when you were inside of them. Um, so we have a number of more ornamental landscapes like our Japanese garden, uh, moss garden, um, an English garden um, surrounding the house as well as a rhododendron glen. Um, but the vast majority of the landscape is actually um, native Pacific Northwest forest. Uh, we opened up to the public in 1988, um, and we welcome about 50,000 people a year um, annually to experience the place. Um, Prentice Bloedel was a conservation pioneer and an early advocate of the positive effects of um, immersion in landscapes to human health and well-being. Um, so one of the things you'll notice when you walk around here that's different about other, uh, different between us and other public gardens is there's no signage anywhere. There's no landscape signage, there's no directional signage, and the whole idea was you were meant to experience landscape to be immersed in it um, and to leave all the stuff behind that plugs up your head on a daily basis and really to experience the landscape as art. A team of gardeners and a plant health manager tend to this special place in the Pacific Northwest. As part of their professionalism, the Bloedel Reserve joined the Sentinel Plant Network. Since uh, 2011, the Bloedel Reserve has been involved with the Sentinel Plant Network, which is a uh, part of the American Public Garden Association. 
And the Sentinel Plant Network's goal, their purpose, is to work with public gardens in detecting and controlling high consequence plant pests and diseases. My role here is as the plant health manager for the Blowdout Reserve, and I deal with trying to mitigate various plant problems, not just pests and diseases, but nutrient and uh, drainage and temperature issues with plants to try to produce the healthiest plants we can here on the grounds. And I work with the staff on the grounds towards that end. And as part of the Sentinel Plant Network, the Bloedel Reserve offers first detector training to the public and anyone in the green industry who would like to take it. And the first detector training uh, teaches attendees about some high consequence pests, how to do plant disease and pest diagnosis, where to send samples, and um, how to deal with these things in a general manner. And it's uh, something that we've also provided to our staff here so that everyone on the grounds is uh, understanding of the issues we're trying to deal with. So in March of 2015, uh, our our gardener who takes care of our, our rhododendron glen, Andy Moss, brought to my attention a sick pieris. It had some branch dieback and some curious leaf spotting on it, and I wasn't sure quite what it was. Uh, but I thought it was having a significant enough impact that we should bring it to WSU and have them see if they could identify it for us so we could deal with this. Uh, so I sent in a lab sample and it came back uh, as positive for Phytophthora remorum, the, the pathogen that causes the disease remorum blight, uh, which incidentally also causes sudden oak death. And that set, in, set the ball rolling on some pretty significant events for the Bloedel Reserve here. What was the process to confirm that P. remorum was responsible for the symptoms on the Pieris? Well, here at the WSU Puyallup Plant and Insect Diagnostic Laboratory, we um, look at for plant problems, insect pests, and things like that that people have on their plants in their gardens and landscapes. So in March of 2015, we got a sample in from the Bloedel Reserve, which is a public garden on Bainbridge Island. And we've worked with Bloedel for many years, so it's nothing new. And I opened it up like I open up any package, and in there was a, a Pieris. And that Pierus had some leaf spots. And so they were wondering, you know, they'd been noticing the leaf spots, they'd been noticing low down in the plant, and they really weren't sure what was going on. So that is my job to figure out what's going on with this Pierus. Well, I looked at it under the microscope, did not see a whole lot of fungal infection or didn't see an insect. And at this point, I'm kind of like, okay, we have more work to do. But the f one of the first things that came to mind is that Pieris is one of the really sense susceptible plants to the disease Phytophthora remorum or sudden oak death or remorum leaf and shoot blights. It goes by a lot of names. So my job was to also check to make sure or screen that the thing that I was seeing wasn't that problem. And I really have to say that when I first looked at the sample, I knew the plant was a mature plant in the landscape. The probability of it being Phytophthora remorum seemed pretty low at that point. But it was one of those susceptible plants and it had sort of symptoms that looked similar. So what I did is I took the sample and I took a little bit of the tissue and I used something called an enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, big long word for a test kit. And it functions basically like a pregnancy kit. You grind up some sample, you put a test strip in, there's a test that's a line that says the test worked, and then if your pathogen of, of, that you're looking for is in that sample as well, there'll be a second line. And so this particular sample first did almost nothing. It was just sitting there, the test was working, and I thought, okay, good. Don't have to worry about this remorum pathogen. And then about, oh, another five minutes later, I looked over and I said, oh, something's wrong, because there was a second line showing up that meant that that pathogen um, was possibly present. Now at this lab, that's about the level of where we go. We go to Phytophthora's present. For the most part, our, our our um, clientele can then have management tools to, to stop it. But because we have this federally regulated issue called Phytophthora morum, we needed to go the one step farther and figure out what the specific Phytophthora is. 
our lab does not have that really testing capacity. So what I did is at this point I recognized that I needed help. And so I took the sample and here at WSU Puyallup, Dr. Marianne Elliott and her team have a great program on Phytophthorus. And I handed them the sample and said, okay, this is the situation. This Pieris in the landscape, been there a while. Last couple months has been having this leaf spot. Can you tell me, you know, is the Phytophthora that I think I detected really there and what actually is it? And at that point, my job was basically done. I had started the diagnosis and got it to the next specialist. Dr. Marianne Elliott cultured the plant tissue and microscopically examined the fungus that grew out. It appeared to be P. ramorum in culture, but to confirm the identification, she took it to the WSU Puyallup Molecular Biosciences Lab for sequencing. So the Blodel sample came to me initially as a culture plate that uh, Marianne had isolated from a sample that Jenny received through the plant clinic. And um, it, it to them looked like a Phytophthora, but they weren't sure exactly what species it was. So they handed it to me and I ran a DNA sequence on it. And the DNA sequence analysis is um, basically looking at a specific region of fungal DNA that, um, that the, the region is general to all fungi, but the sequence itself within that region is specific to a species. Um, so I can use the DNA sequence analysis to determine the species of isolates. And I do that fairly regularly. So with this sample, I ran the DNA sequence and I was relatively surprised that it came back as Phytophthora remorum um, because to my knowledge, we hadn't received a P. remorum sample through the plant clinic before that. Um, so um, I knew Jenny would be interested too, so I texted her. I, I knew she was at a conference and I texted her. And um, apparently she was in a session and, um, and saw the text and excused herself to the hallway and, and called me back. And I let her know that it was pure morum. And uh, I also let Gary and Marianne know. And so there, um, Gary then notified the WSDA and also APHIS, because APHIS is the agency that determines what steps we would take next after a pure morum detection. So whenever we find uh, a situation where we have a, a positive like that, that hasn't been part of a normal regulatory sample, what we do is we would notify uh, WSDA and APHIS that we have detected Phytophthora morum on a plant. Uh, at this particular site. Uh, in this case, it was Blodell. So what I ended up doing is I sent an email uh, to the Western Regional Director for APHIS, copied it to the state APHIS people and WSDA, notifying them that a sample had been sent to our plant clinic and that we had confirmed that it uh, had Phytophthora morum. Uh, this was the first time that this had happened. The fact that it was on an older established plant in a landscape raised a considerable amount of concern about whether or not Phytophthora morum had spread from nurseries into the landscape, whether it was spreading in the landscape. And this has significant regulatory consequences if that in fact was the case. So I, sent, I think I sent the email off at about 11.30 in the morning uh, on a Friday, and uh, uh, I went to have lunch at uh, uh, a fast food restaurant, and I was walking in the parking lot, and my cell phone rang about 30 minutes, 45 minutes later, and it was the Western Regional Director from APHIS asking me about the email and the, uh, the concerns about the sample. USDA APHIS and Washington State Department of Agriculture met with Blodell the following Tuesday to collect samples that were then sequenced at the WSDA lab. The pathogen DNA tested positive and confirmed the presence of P. remorum at Blodell. Once a positive is uh, detected and confirmed, uh, we will respond to the uh, location. Uh, we coordinate, uh, my department, USDA coordinates with uh, WSDA, Washington Department of Agriculture. We visit the site. If it's a nursery site, we will perform a delimitation survey sampling all symptomatic plants that uh, we can locate within the nursery. We also set up a quarantine area, which is uh, for both 
uh, nurseries and residential landscapes. That's a 10 meter radius around the positive plant. And in that area, we will set up or cordon off that area so that we don't allow movement through that area for a 90 day period minimum. We will sample any symptomatic plants in that area. We will set up a two meter destruction radius around the positive plant. And in that area, uh, we remove uh, the positive plant uh, as well as any other host plants in that area. We may take out some symptomatic non-host plants if they're expressing a lot of symptoms as well. That material is um, double bagged, uh, contained. Uh, we practice really extreme sanitation in that area so we don't in inadvertently uh, move any pathogen out when we're destroying the plant. The disposal of that material is by uh, deep burial or burning to ash or steam incineration. In the second year, we will go back to the site and conduct another delimiting survey of that area. And uh, then in the third year, do the same. And if we pick up no more positive, then they're released. That site is released from regulatory uh, action. So during the surveys, our lab generally has two or more people there at the survey site and we help conduct the survey. And then when the survey's done, we bring all the material back here to the lab and that's when we start our testing process. Initially, when the pathogen was first detected at, the, at Bloedel, we conducted approximately a survey a month and then we moved to the quarterly. And so now we get approximately a thousand samples a year from the nursery. And once the samples get back to the lab here, we do initial screening, and then we eventually end up doing DNA analysis on the samples. And if there's a positive, that, uh, there, that, that gets sent off to the APHIS for final confirmation. Uh, Remoran blight is a, a federally regulated disease, and what that means is when it shows up in a garden or a nursery or, or a residence or anywhere within the U.S., the United States Department of Agriculture gets involved because this disease has a very significant potential for uh, economic impact on the regions and states where it's found. And so within about three weeks of its discovery here on the reserve, uh, the USDA showed up along with the Washington State Department of Agriculture and uh, people from Washington State University who uh, do a fair amount of research on the subject. So they came out and the first thing they wanted to do was try to determine the extent of remoran blight on the grounds here and that meant doing a uh, survey of the grounds taking probably hundreds of samples from all different sorts of plants uh, around the infected site. And that over several months resulted in the discovery of a total of 14 infected sites here on the grounds. Most of those are confined to the rhododendron glen, but a couple are also uh, maybe several hundred yards away in our uh, camellia trail area too on some camellia plants. Bloedel followed USDA's protocol to remove and burn all infected plant material as well as non-infected plants within two meters of the infected plants. The gardeners decontaminated their boots and tools with a bleach solution after working in a previously infected site. The federal and state departments of agriculture also conducted an investigation to trace back to the supplying nursery and prevent further movement of the pathogen. So when we started the uh, trace back study, um, we looked at the, each individual site. We, were, we then referenced our plant collections records, which was very important given that the situation that we had at the reserve was we had just completed a large renovation of the rhododendron glen and the, the valley. So we had introduced several hundred plants within the, uh, a very short period of, of time. And it was during this process that 
we noticed the problem and started to implement mitigation processes. Um, so I assembled a list of all the vendors that we had received plants from, um, pinpointed how I acquired in, and propagated things in-house or bought things from external vendors, um, provided those lists to um, USDA, then they subsequently traced those back um, to various different nurseries, did an inventory of, of those nurseries. Um, unfortunately, that didn't give us any conclusive evidence of where we um, came upon the disease, so it's quite possible that it had been here for years and just was undetected. Um, but it was a fairly simple process to run through. Um, the most important aspect of that was just having a good record of where plants came from, where they moved in the garden, um, and how they got to be in their final location. Removal and destruction of infected plant material, decontamination of boots and tools, and a traceback survey intended to find the source of the infected plant were all USDA protocols to stop the further spread of the disease. P. remorum can also spread through water flow when rain or irrigation water carries spores across the soil. Part of the USDA um, mitigation plan that we worked on uh, was to limit surface flow of, of water, be, that, be it in the beds in infected areas um, or trails. So we systematically went about monitoring how water moved on the surface um, in those various quarantine sites, how visitors moved through those spaces, then developed individual plans for each site, um, taking those elements into consideration in the site that we're standing in. Um, we redid all of the uh, trails to slope water runoff to various drain systems. So a number of the, most of the sites have pretty extensive drainage under those. Um, but it was all how to just eliminate any surface water run, runoff. Bloedel Reserve has approximately two miles of trails and lots of visitors, so there was concern about spread of the disease to other parts of Bloedel by the visitors. But they had to figure out how to manage visitor movement in a way that wouldn't change the Bloedel experience. One thing that I've appreciated in the collaborations with um, outside organizations is when we found what the, the issues are that we have been encouraged to find creative solutions that match our mission. Uh, one, of our, one example of that is the use of uh, woven fences. Um, we had to place barriers in landscapes that were impacted by uh, Phytophthora remorum um, so we could uh, prohibit people from entering into those landscapes. And instead of being required to have um, posts with yellow caution tape on them to keep people out of there, uh, we were able to develop um, some really attractive woven fences that are low to the ground that uh, serve that purpose very well, but also match the aesthetic um, of what we're trying to do here. And for us, the experience is key. Um, it's at the forefront, and we really wanted to make sure that it wasn't compromised by having to deal um, with this pathogen. Phytophthora species, including P. remorum, typically produce spores that allow them to survive in soil. Steam treatment has been shown to be effective at removing inoculum of these pathogens from soil, pots, and media. Steaming is a method uh, that's used to decontaminate soil uh, for a number of different pests and pathogens. And in our case, um, and at Bloedel, we're using it to remove uh, Phytophthora remorum from the soil. Um, but heat will kill everything, so it's a very general kind of treatment. Um, and so we have to heat the soil uh, to a certain temperature to be sure that we kill all of the spore stages of P. remorum. And that temperature is 50 degrees centigrade, um, or about 122 Fahrenheit. And so um, we have to heat the soil to that temperature um, as far uh, at a certain depth. So we, we uh, measure it at uh, 
30 centimeters or a foot, uh, 15 centimeters or six inches, and then about uh, five centimeters uh, from the surface to be sure that we reach that target temperature of 50 C and it has to stay that hot for about half an hour or so. So when we were first doing these uh, steaming studies, um, we took samples at Bloedel uh, before and after steaming. So we took soil samples at the three depths that I mentioned, um, and we took them to the lab and cultured for Phytophthora to see where the Phytophthora was um, before steaming. And then um, we took the same samples in the soil after steaming, and um, we actually didn't find any. Uh, so the steaming, that shows that the steaming worked uh, the way it was supposed to. It killed everything in the soil when we treated it, uh, such that the temperature reached 50 degrees um, for at least half an hour at the different soil depths. So now when we do steaming studies or treatments, we don't have to take samples um, because we know that the temperature um, for that amount of time will kill uh, everything in the soil that we're trying to kill. Can chemical treatments be part of a P. remorum IPM plan? One of the unfortunate things with Phytophthora remorum that causes remorum blight is it cannot be killed off by any known chemical methods but several do inhibit its growth significantly to reduce its production of inoculum and control its spread. So we were provided a list of uh, chemicals from some research that are known to control Phytophthora remorum uh, effectively enough to be useful in a program. And we determined that a monthly spray alternating between three different chemicals uh, was a good idea. Uh, our last, we started these sprays in uh, about November 2015, and our last confirmed positive was January 2016. And it's now well over a year and a half since then, and we've had uh, no new positives of remorum blight uh, found on the reserve since then. Uh, when, we, when we do our sprays to control remorum blight, uh, we're not spraying just the infected areas. We're spraying those areas as well as surrounding uh, areas of the landscape. So most of the positives are found in the rhododendron glen. So we're spraying pretty much the entire area referred to as the rhododendron glen, which is probably over 10,000 square feet, at least more than that. And um, it's not really a blanket spray, although we do end up spraying most of it. It's mostly spraying species that are on or related to species on the USDA's host list, which in the case of the rhododendron glen is just about every plant in there. And then we also spray uh, over on the Camellia Trail where we had two positive sites. Um, those sites plus the surrounding areas along the trail were sprayed as well every month. Prevention is the most important part of any IPM plan. To prevent the introduction of P. remorum, know which hosts are susceptible and the symptoms of infection. Make sure that the nurseries where you buy plants follow excellent best management practices. Inspect plants before purchasing. There are uh, five genus of plants uh, that uh, have been found to be most susceptible to P. remorum. Uh, rhododendron, Calmia, Camellia, Viburnum, and Pieris uh, plants uh, have been uh, the ones that have been most, within the nursery trade, uh, come up positive the most times. Uh, in the regulated states. Um, there are also uh, is a genus list uh, or a host list of plants. It's an extensive list. It's added to uh, many times over the years. Um, it's important to note that uh, a plant susceptibility is, is sort of a function of how much inoculum is uh, in the environment. And we've we have what we kind of consider secondary hosts in Washington State. Salal is, is one that, uh, that we've had numerous positive on, but it, it's not a, a plant that it's, you know, it's basically everywhere, but it's not a plant that we 
uh, would normally consider being uh, highly uh, uh, susceptible. It just gets the disease. So it's kind of a secondary or background indicator plant. Uh, there are also some host associated plant list as well uh, available online to, to those that want to look up, uh, you know, what plants are, have been found to be uh, susceptible to the disease. Also, as you purchase plants, you should check out who you're buying the plants from. There should be a licensed nursery, whether they're here or in another state. It's worth your time to go visit that nursery and to see what their practices are. Are they, are they doing a good job on their sanitation? Are you seeing standing water around the nursery? Are the plants healthy? And if they're not healthy, then you should not take delivery. Bloedel Reserve follows these guidelines when they purchase plants. They also have a quarantine program for new plants being brought to Bloedel. Arguably one of the most important steps in controlling remoran blight on the reserve is preventing its reintroduction because it's, it hasn't disappeared from the world yet and so we could always see its return to the Bloedel Reserve and the best way to do that is to have a quarantine program and what that entails is having an area at our nursery set aside where new plants that we purchase are set aside separately from our other nursery plants where they can be monitored and this this quarantine period lasts uh, six to eight weeks and during that time we'll keep an eye out for symptoms on these plants and part of uh, maintaining this quarantine area is to not treat these plants with fungicides because we want these plants, if they're infected with remoran blight or something else, we want them to express those symptoms so we can identify it and deal with it. After the six to eight week period that these plants are not uh, showing any symptoms of remoran blight, they're released to be planted out on the grounds. The Bloedel Reserve has set an example that we can all follow to detect and mitigate serious landscape plant problems. Phytophthora remorum research and education has been ongoing at WSU Puyallup for over a decade and will continue into the future. So in 2003, uh, Phytophthora remorum, which causes uh, the disease sudden oak death, was detected in the state of Washington. Uh, it turns out that uh, conifers such as Douglas fir and grand fir were also added to the host list. Uh, as a result of that, because of the research that we've been doing on Christmas trees, there's a potential implication for uh, the, uh, this disease negatively impacting the Christmas tree industry and the conifer nursery industry. So we started working on uh, information about the potential impact of this disease on conifers that are used for the production of Christmas trees and also interested in looking at what impact it might have to our conifers in our forest situation. So when we started this project in 2003 we did not have the facilities here to actually conduct research uh, here at Puyallup. It's a federally regulated uh, exotic pathogen, uh, so you have to have specialized facilities, containment facilities to do this work. So initially we were doing research uh, on this uh, at fa using facilities at Oregon State University. Uh, in 2005 we were able to construct a biocontainment facility here at Puyallup as well as in 2007, I believe, start a molecular lab and molecular aspects of uh, identification, different genotypes of the pathogen are extremely important uh, in doing research. So our program consists of research activities. Uh, a lot of this relates to the spread of the pathogen, the genotyping of the pathogen. Uh, we use that genotyping information to track whether or not when the uh, pathogen is detected in streams, whether it's coming from nurseries or a potential landscape uh, infestation. Once it's found in nurseries or in landscape situations, there's a lot of work done to eliminate it or eradicate it from those sites. Steaming the soil was part of the P. Remorum mitigation plan at the Bloedel Reserve. Steaming research at WSU Puyallup continues in order to refine the steaming protocols for pathogen elimination. 
the uh, steaming research that we do, uh, we want to know um, how deep we have to treat the soil because it takes a long time to heat the soil up at 30 centimeters as opposed to closer to the surface. So if we didn't have to treat it all the way down to that temperature um, at 30 centimeters, you know, that'd be really great. So one of the things we're looking at is how far into the soil the Phytophthora spores can travel, how deep they can move. Um, so we have a couple experiments where we're looking at that. Uh, in our lab, we have a soil columns set up that have different thicknesses of soil um, at the three depths we're talking about, you know, five, 15 and 30 centimeters. And we put Phytophthora remorum uh, infected leaves on top of those columns and we let the spores move down through water and um, see how much Phytophthora comes out. So we're doing that experiment in our biocontainment lab. And then we're doing that on a larger scale at the Norsduck facility in California at the research site. And um, we're doing that in bigger columns under uh, field conditions. Um, and so we're, we're looking at, uh, at how deep it, it can move in the soil. And uh, depending on the soil type, uh, we, it's different. So we don't know yet. Biocontrol research is also being conducted at WSU Puyallup. Biocontrol um, is a, a good alternative to using chemical fungicides. Sometimes you don't want to use chemicals. Um, chemicals can kill the beneficial organisms in some cases. So, but they are not always as 100% effective as chemical fungicides, but they can still control the amount of inoculum that's out there. So we've been looking at uh, a fungus called trichoderma, which um, has been shown in laboratory experiments to um, actually parasitize the Phytophthora. So it'll, um, you know, grow towards it. It'll make uh, antibiotics that will attack or uh, degrade the Phytophthora. It'll wrap around it and, you know, actually penetrate the, the Phytophthora. So this stuff works great in the lab. Um, so we are testing it in field conditions in the soil uh, at Bloedel. And there's commercial uh, trichoderma products. Uh, so we tested one of those that has a species that came from Alaska, so it's adapted to colder soils like we have. And we're also testing a new one um, that's being developed by Tim Widmer, who's a researcher at USDA. And he found that this trichoderma species is very aggressive towards P. remorum. And he did that study at Norsduck. So we tested that one out there as well. So uh, we're still doing this study, we, um, and we don't have clear results yet about how well it's performing, but we can see that the trichoderma does stay in the soil uh, for at least six months, maybe a year. In addition to the P. remorum research program, WSU has an education program for nursery and landscape professionals, homeowners, and master gardeners to learn about symptom recognition. Early detection is key to reducing the risk of a widespread outbreak. The Phytophthora remorum detection was unexpected, but the Bloedel administrators and employees tackled the problem head-on. They worked thoughtfully and diligently through the process with USDA, WSDA, and WSU to stop P. remorum in its tracks. So one of the things that I'm most proud of that has happened here is the collaboration that has happened with us and the USDA, WSU, and with the Bloodow staff. And we've worked hard to bring everybody together to come up with ideas on how to best contain the pathogen. It's a very unique situation, the only one that's happening in the country. So it's, it's important. And as we're going through, we're learning, but we have, we all have a lot of experience that we bring to the table and sharing that. And I really think that we're doing a good job here. And so we had a sampling, very intensive sampling last year, and it was negative. And that came after a year of very intense mitigation efforts. So that to me says we're on the right track. And our work here will continue into the future. So this is an excellent example 
of actually how the process and system should work. Uh, because here we had the Bloedel Reserve, they're a member of the National Sentinel Plant Network. Uh, they're constantly looking for unusual things that show up on plants. They submit these samples to the plant clinics, uh, particularly the one here in Puyallup, uh, and for accurate identification of these. Uh, and so this was a situation that uh, because someone was looking, uh, in this case Bloedel, but it could be a landscaper, it could be a homeowner, uh, it could be uh, people in my crew who are out looking and stuff and they see something that's a little unusual uh, and they submit it for proper identification. And as a result of that, this detection was made. So, so far, the, the Bloedel Reserve has been very successful in controlling remoran blight on the grounds here. And while all these steps that we do are incredibly important, in controlling this and um, having such good success, I would say the number one most important thing that we have done that helps with our success is having all our staff on board and very willing to take care of this disease and knowledgeable. And the, the, the crew here at the Bloater Reserve has been absolutely fabulous and we could not have had the success that we've had without their involvement and interest and love of the gardens. I, I think, it just honestly, I'd say that we feel very fortunate because um, we had some lemons to deal with and we were able to make lemonade, um, but do it through partnership with people that are experts in things that we're not. Um, and as a result of that, our staff has learned a whole lot. Um, I think that our experience has actually improved some and we've been able to develop friendships and partnerships that um, have gotten us through this and I think also serve as a platform for as we move ahead. So I'm just really thankful.